We're starting a new sermon series uh, for the rest of the summer. Back in January, we began a, a, a Bible study together reading program. And uh, I know there's quite a few people that were participating. Um, and during the month of January, our sermons were focused around whatever was being read that week. So we're going to be doing something very similar um, to that for the months of July and August. And I did make a mistake um, with the guys that are preaching. So we're going to be a little bit off, you know, as trying to calculate what days they were going to have to preach from. I ended up being like a week so our sermons are going to be like a week behind, but you'll, you've read it at least two weeks ago. Um, but we'll be doing, following along with our reading as closely as possible for the months of July and August. If you started reading with us in January and have gotten behind, I encourage you, um, just jump ahead to where we're at now so that you can uh, be reading along with us as we're um, going through the months of July and August. Um, if uh, you never even started, um, no time like the present to jump in and start reading. In, our, in your bulletins, there's a link to our webpage um, where you can go and find out how to get the app that you can download to a digital device. And um, if you have questions on how to, to get connected to our reading program, I can help you with that. Just call the church office. There's also a printed version of our reading program uh, on the back in the in the lobby on the table. Um, so really want to encourage us to be reading together. We were actually going to start this next this um, this sermon series next week um, with um, Scott Cornell uh, beginning the series. But as uh, we were reading this last couple of weeks and uh, reading through Leviticus, and reading through all the, the rituals, uh, the sacrifices, and purity laws, and everything, um, I just, I thought it would be beneficial to try to help us connect this book of Leviticus that many times for Christians seems difficult to read, and sometimes seems somewhat irrelevant. The book of Leviticus really is very relevant and has some important lessons for us as Christians today. So I want to begin with a very brief um, overview of the book of Leviticus. Um, and by the way, um, whether you're doing the read through the Bible with us, or I know there's many people that are doing their your own kind of read through the Bible and you've been doing it each year, I strongly encourage you to check out Bible Project's overviews. They have an overview of each book of the Bible, and that's available on BibleProject.com. It's um, available on YouTube by searching for Bible Project and the name of a book of the Bible. They're just exceptional overviews of each book of the Bible. Um, I'll be using the Bible Project's kind of their poster of their overview of the book of Leviticus, and hopefully if you picked up a bulletin, you got a small copy of that, so that you can reference that, either looking on the screen back here or your own little copy. And when we're done today, um, stick that copy at the beginning of the book of Leviticus for the next time you're going through it. The central theme of Leviticus is God's holiness. And if you remember, holy just means what? It means basically you're set apart. We've talked about that a couple of times this year already. God is set apart as creator, as the author of life. God is set apart. He is unique. That first song that we sang this morning, there is no one like our God. He is totally set apart from his creation. And the space that's around God, that's filled with his life, his goodness, his justice, his purity, is also holy. And so the dilemma that the book of Leviticus resolves is how can Israel, who is unjust 
and sinful and under the consequences of sin, which is death, how can Israel um, enter into God's space, God's presence? The book of Leviticus is God's gracious way of providing a way for Israel to move into, to enter God's space, to draw near to God. The book of Leviticus is symmetrical in design, and uh, I don't know if you can see the screen well enough, but on your papers, if you can see, um, there's kind of on the outer sections, there's um, a section on rituals, ritual sacrifices and ritual feasts and festivals. And the next intersection, you can see there's a section on priests, their ordinations, and then priests, their qualifications. And then you go down a little further, and there's a section on purity, moral uh, uh, ritual purity and moral purity. So a very symmetrical um, design, of, um, a seeming uh, apparently intentional design by the author. The rituals that are included, um, these uh, in the ritual sections, they included um, sacrifices and feasts and festivals. The sacrifices, the ritual sacrifices, provided a way for the Israelites to express thanks to God and a way for them um, to say, I'm sorry, to uh, make restitution, to um, receive purification. By these rituals, the Israelites were constantly reminded of God's grace and that God allowed an animal's blood, an animal's life to make atonement for, to cover their impurity and their sin. And these rituals were remi a reminder of God's justice and the seriousness of their evil and the consequences of their evil because it required the life of an animal. The ritual feasts and festivals um, each retold a different part of the story of how God had delivered Israel from Egypt and brought them into the promised land and they were a way of regularly remembering who they were and who God was to them. So that's the sexual on, section on rituals. The next section on the priests covers the process by which Aaron and his sons and their descendants um, were and would be ordain, ordained for service before God, and it covered their qualifications or what was required of them as they facilitated in the rituals the Israelites were supposed to follow. The priests were called to the highest level of moral integrity and ritual holiness because they represented the people before God and they represented God to the people. They were kind of the intermedi inter intermediary. And then we get down to the sections on purity, on ritual and moral purity. Ritual purity emphasizes the ways by which the Israelites could become unclean or impure and thus be unable to participate in the ritual sacrifices and feasts. And even more importantly, they were unable to be in God's space because of God's holiness. And this section also explained what they needed to do to, do to correct that, to become pure, to become clean. Moral purity emphasized how the Israelites, um, this section on moral purity emphasized how the Israelites were to organize their society, their daily lives, and how it would be distinct and different from the Canaanite people around them. They were to care for the poor instead of overlooking the poor. They were to have a high level of sexual integrity. They were to promote justice throughout the land and many other things. So that's a very brief um, but incomplete overview of Leviticus. But I hopeful, hopefully that brief overview um, is enough to show how Leviticus emphasizes God's holiness and how in his grace he provided a way for um, sinful people for him to be able to live and with sinful people in peace and how he called the Israelites to be a separate and holy people. Today, I want to focus on the section of ritual purity. 
um, and specifically ritual purity, not because moral purity um, is unimportant, but moral purity kind of already resonates with us as Christians. Um, the New Testament emphasizes and encourages many of the same commands for moral purity as Leviticus. Jesus and the apostles direct us to things, like I've already said, about caring for the poor and needy among us, um, having a high level of sexual integrity, of, of acting justly and righteously, and many other things. So we're familiar with moral purity. But the section on ritual purity is kind of foreign to us. And to illustrate that, have you ever been prevented or anyone you know been prevented from coming to worship because of touching, say, a dead mouse or a pet? Or if you're a deer hunter, um, you've just killed a deer. Has, has any, anyone here been prevented from coming to worship because of touching something dead? Or um, how about have you been, pre pre been prevented or anyone you know been prevented from coming to worship because of a skin disease or, or condition like psoriasis or eczema? No. Those things are examples of things that would make the Israelites unclean and would prevent them from coming to worship. And I wanted it to um, clarify something. Um, in many of our translations, it says leprosy. Um, and a, a better word, um, a better translation uh, is probably lesion, or a less technical term would be a scaly skin. Leprosy, or as we know it, is Hansen's disease, and it was not reported in the Near East, which is where the Israelites were before the time of Alexander the Great. So, and the descriptions in Leviticus of these skin conditions match um, psoriasis and eczema and some other things better than they do what we know as leprosy. So, I just want to make, you know, when I use the word skin condition or disease and you're wondering why I'm not using leprosy, that's why, um, because it gives us a better picture. So, uh, touching dead things or having a skin disease are a couple examples of things that would make a person ritually unclean and thus prevented from participating in the rituals, the sacrifices, feasts, and festivals of God that he'd commanded them to observe. They created a barrier between the unclean or impure Israelites and a clean and pure God. There were other ways of becoming richly unclean that were unavoidable, coming into contact with blood or certain other bodily fluids, coming into contact with mold or mildew, were also ways that the Israelites would become unclean. Basically, everyone of the Israelites would become richly unclean many times, probably on a monthly basis, um, throughout their life. There are a couple, about four things that we need to understand about how the laws of ritual purity um, in, in Leviticus um, affected them. First, the things that made you unclean, touching blood or, and, and certain other bodily fluids, having a skin disease, touching mold, touching dead things, those things are associated with mortality and loss of life. You became contaminated when you touched death, so to speak, by those things that are associated with mortality and loss of life. So you became contaminated by them and became unclean or impure because death is the opposite of God whose essence is life. The second, and this is important to note, simply being unclean or impure was not sinful. Touching these things, that was a normal part of life. Um, when, when we, if we were to look at the section, that corresponding section on moral 
purity, those things that they were commanded about, those were things that we would consider sinful. These ritual purity things were just, they just happened. They were a normal part of life. And to emphasize this, um, that un this uncleanness, this ritual impurity wasn't about sin, consider, for example, that there were Levites who were given the task of carrying the remains of a sacrifice. Some of the sacrifices were not totally consumed on the altar. Some of the remains had to be taken outside of the, um, the camp and burned. And those Levites who were given that task to do that would then end up becoming unclean because they had touched a dead thing. So basically, by obeying God's commands, they became unclean. So you can see that this um, impurity and this uncleanness and, the, and these ritual things wasn't about sin. And third, it's important to note the state of being impure or unclean was generally temporary. Um, oftentimes, the remedy was a simple sacrifice or um, at evening to take a bath, and then, then you became clean again. There were only a few situations that that uncleanness was more permanent. For example, a skin disease that would not heal. In that situation, the individual had to go and live outside of the camp. And the final thing that we should note is that impact of purity or impurity, cleanness or uncleanness, that it had on the Israelites and their interaction with God. At the close of the section on ritual purity of God's laws, we read this very serious warning. It says, Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. A very serious warning of how much God was wanting to emphasize cleanness and uncleanness, purity and impurity, because of their relationship with him, who was a pure, clean, holy God. So being in a state of uncleanness or impurity, it created a barrier between the Israelites and worship of their God with the rest of their people. What was the point of this ritual purity, this cleanness and uncleanness? Because it was such a regular part of their lives, this ritual purity became a constant reminder to them of God's holiness and of how God in his grace was providing a way for a people who were unclean, who were contaminated by death, even bound by death, to come in to his space, the space of God who is pure, clean, and who is life. There are constant reminders that the holy God, the set-apart creator God, had set them apart to be holy as he is holy. So, how do the Levitical laws regarding ritual purity affect our understanding and our faith in Jesus Christ. One of our readings from last week helped me make that connection. In fact, I might not have noticed the connection if we weren't doing this Bible reading program that kind of tries to connect Old Testament readings with New Testament readings. The particular reading was from Mark chapter 5. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse, after hearing about Jesus, came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I shall get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. According to the laws of ritual purity in Leviticus, this woman had been in a state of uncleanness for 12 years. I mean, not only had she endured 
it says, much at the hands of physicians and spent all that she had. Besides that, she was in this perpetual state of uncleanness. And remember, uncleanness created this barrier that, separ that kept her from the God space, from participating in the worship, the sacrifices, the feasts, the festivals. Because of the consequences of sin in this world that started with Adam and Eve in the garden, the consequences of sickness, disease, and death, this woman was unclean and pure and could not enter God's space. And that makes the healing that she received by faith through Jesus means so much more. He did far more that day than heal her of a debilitating physical illness. He removed that barrier that prevented her from participating in the fullness of Israel's worship of God. There's another very similar example of Jesus removing a barrier of uncleanness. It's um, of a Jewish man who is kept from joining in with the rest of his people in worship at the temple of coming into God's space. Instead of reading that scripture, I want to share a video clip from the Chosen TV series. As you're watching, look beyond the miracle of physical healing and try to imagine from that man's perspective how much more Jesus' act of kindness meant for this, what it meant for this man. Not to spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. Mr. Leper, stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his hair. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 you cannot this disease. You Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. So I know you can heal me if you are willing. Tunic. Just one of you, just one of you. That's <laughs> enough. Green is 
is definitely your color. <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> Sorry, I watched it. I watched that a couple of times already, and it still um, hits me emotionally. I hope the significance of what Jesus did for the woman who had been bleeding for twelve years, and what the man who had his skin, skin condition is—it's not lost on us. And I just as we we're watching that, I realized, you know psoriasis or eczema, like skin conditions we're aware of, they aren't necessarily life-threatening. But you notice the emphasis in there was about cleanness. You can make me clean. Which wasn't necessarily about the physical healing, which was part of it, but that relationship to a holy God Remember what the emphasis, the main emphasis Leviticus, Leviticus was? The main emphasis of the whole book of Leviticus is God's holiness and his grace in providing a way for sinful people to live in his presence. Sure, Jesus brought physical healing, but he brought something of infinitely greater worth. He removed the uncleanness that created the barrier between people, and God. Jesus was God's ultimate plan for providing a way for sinful people to live in his presence. And Jesus demonstrated through his power to heal. Both the Gospels of Luke and Mark record how Jesus told a paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven and if you remember in those accounts, it caused quite a stir with the religious leaders where they said, who, who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus' response to them, well, which is easier to say your sins have been forgiven or to say rise up and walk? But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise and take up your stretcher and go home. At once he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Jesus had authority to forgive sins. Jesus had the power to remove the barrier between us and God. The accounts of Jesus' healings, his miracles are truly amazing, but we must not let the physical reality cause us to lose sight of their true importance. Jesus' purpose was to bring to fulfillment what God had begun way back in the book of Leviticus, that book that is sometimes difficult to read and maybe sometimes seems irrelevant to us. But Jesus was the fulfillment of that book. Jesus' purpose was to bring fulfillment to what God started, bringing life, giving eternal purity cleansing from the results and the consequences of sin. There's something very important um, that I left out at the beginning when I was sharing that overview of Leviticus. And if on your papers you see there's those matching sections, right in the middle, at the bottom, there is a section on the Day of Atonement. This day, once a year, was the one day that the high priest and only the high priest could enter the area of the tabernacle or temple that was called the Holy of Holies. And this area was strictly off limits except that one time a year. And on this day, the high priest would bring two goats to the tabernacle or the temple, and the priest would cast lots, and one goat would be chosen for the Lord as a sin offering, and the other would be chosen as a scapegoat. I'm going to read from Leviticus chapter 16. It says, Then he shall slaughter the goat. Is that slide's not up there? 
Oh, it's about, okay, you can read it. That's good. Uh, then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins, and thus you shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. And then verses 21 through 22, then Aaron shall lay both of his hands, those hands that were now covered in blood from the sacrifice of that first goat, and lay his hand on his hand his hands on the head of the live goat, and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel, and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay, lay them on the head of the goat, and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness, and the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. At the heart of Leviticus, we see the foreshadowing of God's ultimate plan to completely bring purification for our sins and to remove all those sins from us and place them on Jesus Christ so that we could draw near and live perpetually in his presence. There is a challenge that I want to leave with us today, and it's the same that God left with the Israelites at the end of the book of Leviticus. It is the challenge to faithfulness and obedience to, to God. God told the Israelites exactly what would happen to them if they were faithful and what would happen if they turned away. Faithfulness would bring peace, abundance, and especially God's presence. He would dwell with them. But if they were unfaithful, they would experience disaster and they would be exiled from the good land that God had given them. And most importantly, God would no longer dwell among them. We have the same call upon us to be faithful and obedient, to remain connected to Jesus who gives us life through his spirit. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he compares believers to branches that are grafted into an olive tree. Um, the olive tree representing being believers being grafted into the kingdom of God. But his warning to them was that they should continue in God's kindness, otherwise they would be cut back off the olive tree. What God has done for us through Jesus Christ removing the barrier of our sin and our impurity is truly amazing. Let's uh, remember that continually. Let's live out our lives in faithfulness and obedience to our God and to our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to close with prayer as the worship team comes forward. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise you you are holy. There really is no one like you. You are set apart from us as our creator, the one who has given us life, who is surrounded by um, purity and holiness, um, goodness, love, justice. Father, we thank you for your great grace and mercy in providing a way for us to be in your, in your space, in your presence. Father, um, we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.